So it's the 2000 Summer Paralympics in Sydney. We're in the final moments of the men's intellectual disability basketball finals, and Spain is up by 24. They've been killing it all week, and they're about to finish off Russia and jump to third in the medal table behind the United States and Britain. The entire country is, needless to say, thrilled. And why wouldn't they be? Unlike the cutthroat Olympics, the Paralympic Games are probably the most beloved sporting event in the whole world. It's a celebration of triumph over hardship, the wonder of the human spirit. It's one of the few times where athletes are all pulling for each other, and there are no real losers, but winning is just a bit sweeter, and Spain's making it look easy on the hardwood. The last few seconds tick away and the team comes out on top. Journalists are writing copies about all the adversity these 12 young men have overcome to climb atop the podium and receive their much-deserved gold medals. They're soon to be national treasures, a testament to guts, grit, courage, and hard work. If they could accomplish their dreams, what's stopping you? And as the national anthem plays and the crowd applauds, the moment seems picture-perfect. But little did the world know, it was a lie. All of it was a lie. Doping remains a notorious issue for both the Olympic and Paralympic Games, but especially for the latter. It's easy to see why. Due to the very nature of the event, many of the participants are on performance-enhancing drugs to treat physical disabilities, so policing drug abuse during the Games has always been a challenge. A common form of doping is boosting, by which athletes with a spinal cord injury induce autonomic dysreflexia and spike their blood pressure for increased performance. This practice was banned by the International Paralympic Committee in 1994, but it's still an ongoing problem in the sport. To combat the issue in 2000, the Sydney Games established a doping control program, and for the first time, Paralympic athletes were asked to participate in out-of-competition drug testing. This was a good step to take. It meant that the testing window was much wider, and any competitor could be called for a test at any point throughout the Games, and it worked. 14 athletes tested positive. It practically saved the powerlifting competition from becoming a total farce. But suppose a potential cheater was operating with a different premise. See, the doping control program was designed to police participants from using drugs to gain an unfair physical advantage. But what if an athlete desired instead to be disadvantaged? What if, say, a non-disabled person pretended to be disabled to compete? How would you police that? But, I mean, come on, why would you need to police that? Who would be so morally repugnant to try it? This is Fernando Martín Vicente. At the time of the Sydney Games, he was the president of the Spanish Federation of Sports People with Intellectual Disabilities. And by the time our story concludes, he will be found guilty of fraud and forgery. Here's a recent photo of him shaking hands with the Pope. I'm not gonna act like I know this man's character. It's been almost two decades since the event we're talking about, and a lot can change in that time. I do know that when you're the head of an organization like FETI, there's constant pressure to get a hold of government grants. It's a surefire way to keep the lights on, and often the only option to accomplish your institution's agenda. But grants don't come easy. There's a lot of organizations seeking them, and only so much money to go around, so priority goes to associations that have a track record of success. And at that point, the only thing on your mind is win medals. Because the more medals you win, the more incentive the government has to extend grant money in your direction. So why not, just for one year, enter a team that's almost guaranteed to win? Yeah, but how do you do that? Well, what if your team wasn't actually disabled? How much easier could it be to come in first? And again, you're only doing it the one time. Just win a gold medal and the incentives for grants is guaranteed. Your organization will stay afloat for the foreseeable future, you'll employ plenty of people, and in doing so, your association can continue to assist those who are mentally disabled for maybe decades to come. It's a classic case of trying to justify shady behavior in the name of the greater good. So Fetty set out to build a super team, and build it they did. All that was necessary was to recruit some fairly competitive basketball players who were willing to keep their mouths shut about the scam, and things were set. I mean, they really only needed to hire like two or three players tops to pull something like this off, right? I guess five if you wanted to stack your side of the court during play, but Spain took it even further. They recruited ten. <laughs> ten. Ten players out of the 12-man roster were not actually disabled. If you're like me, the only thing on your mind is, how? 
how did they pull this off? How did nobody notice this? It's a fair question to ask. See, in order to qualify as a participant in the intellectual disability basketball event, a prospective player is required to complete a litany of mental tests to determine their eligibility. The competitor must be determined to have an IQ of no more than 75. So these 10 guys had to purposely fail a series of intelligence tests and make it look authentic. Naturally, I decided to test this myself. What if I was one of the 10? Could I fake my way through an IQ test into the category of mental disability? I mean, how hard could it be? But there was a challenge. I mean, I needed to score low enough to qualify for the event, but also high enough so as to not attract any suspicion from hypothetical outside auditors. I figured 55 was a good target to aim for. So a bit about the IQ test. It measures several factors of intelligence like logical reasoning, math skills, language abilities, spatial relations skills, knowledge retained, and the ability to solve novel problems. Though it's always had some controversy associated with it, it's still a fairly good way of judging a person's level of intelligence. IQ IQ is also fluid, it changes with age, and in that respect I was a little nervous. I mean, I hadn't taken a math test in almost a decade. But I'm trying to fail, right? So no worries. The challenge wasn't going to be so much scoring under 75, but scoring over 55. It is incredibly hard to judge that kind of thing. You go into the test blind, and there's no real way of gauging your progress as you take it. So I think the trick to this is like going to be to answer in a way that's close to right, but not quite correct. Does that make sense? Two women start at the same point. They walk in opposite directions for three meters, then turn right and walk another four meters. How far apart are they? Some Gobblesteins are Pajanters, and all Pajanters are Goebbelsons. Are some Gobblesteins definitely Goebbelsons? <sighs> it's too early for this. Okay. <clears throat> Add the even numbers in this list, 2, 4, 6, 11, 18, 37, 38. Is the sum an even number or an odd number? Well, oh. Oh, I answered that one right on accident. After about 40 minutes of deliberation, your boy walked away with an IQ score of 25. Might have undershot that a bit. So sure, I guess technically I wouldn't have had any problems qualifying, but I don't know if such a score would have allayed suspicion either. Another point I should probably make note of here. In the research for this video, I read conflicting reports as to how extensive the testing was for each player on Spain's team. Some claimed to have never been tested at all. Some alleged that they purposely scored low on tests issued, and other reports I read stated that all medical forms were forged from an outside source and delivered to officials without any players being made aware at all. But whichever way you take it, the end result was the same. They all managed to slip in with no issues. But every crazy story needs crazy twists, and this one's got a doozy. If this whole thing was a Hollywood movie, the main character would undoubtedly be this guy, Carlos Ribagorda. Seaman was one of the 10 recruited players that was in on the scam, and during the games he helped propel Spain to victory, but a few weeks after the closing ceremony, he sent his medal back to Paralympic headquarters as well as his team kit and the 150 pounds that each Spanish athlete was given for the Sydney trip. Was it a sudden change of heart? Had his conscience finally gotten the best of him? Don't count on it. The truth? Carlos Ribagorda was an undercover investigative journalist, and he was blowing the whistle on the whole operation. So, details are a little fuzzy about all of this, but here's what we do know. After two years of work to successfully infiltrate the ring, Seaman was called up five months before the Sydney Games and asked to participate. There were five months of training with not a single disabled person in sight. The two genuinely disabled players came from outside Madrid. In all that time, the only medical test he was ever subjected to? Six push-ups, then a blood pressure check. 110 over 78. Think I'm good. So they hit the floor in Sydney and during their first match, the team played so well against their disabled opponents that they were up 30 points by halftime. At that point, their coach told them to slow down and let the other team shoot more, saying allegedly, let's move down a gear or they'll figure out you're not disabled. So they moved down a gear and it made no difference. When you've stacked the deck so deeply and so well, how could it? The entire week they cut down team after team after team and suddenly we're back to the medal ceremony. As the anthem plays, as with every event in the Paralympics, reporters begin to snap photos of the champions. And soon those photos are sent to newspapers all over Spain. They're the nation's Paralympic champions after all. But funny thing about photos, they tend to get seen.
When the team's picture appeared on the front page of a popular Madrid sports daily, it didn't take too long for players and coaches in that photo to get recognized. In an online article, the comments section began to be filled with people claiming to know this guy or that guy, how they weren't disabled at all, and the whole scheme began to slowly but surely unravel. Officials caught wind of the brewing storm and advised the players to wear sunglasses, hats, and grow beards so they wouldn't be recognized when the team arrived back home. After the plane touched down, Seaman got off the flight and blew the whistle by publishing one of the most bizarre exclusives of all time. And two weeks later, the team was officially disqualified and ordered to return the gold medals. The fallout was so bad that the IPC announced they would officially suspend all the events that involved intellectual disabilities abilities all of them, due to serious difficulties in determining the eligibility of athletes. That suspension would not be lifted until 2009. In 2013, after a decade of investigation and court battles, Fernando Martín Vicente was found guilty of fraud and forgery, and he was fined 5,400 euros. A lot of folks would call it a slap on the wrist, but to be fair, he was also ordered to return the 150,000 euros that he received from sponsorships due to the team's victory. As for those 10 fake disabled Paralympians, when all was said and done, they walked away with no charges. This is the point in the video where I'm supposed to come up with some kind of moral, to wax poetic about how crime doesn't pay and cheaters never prosper. But I can't because that's not true. The world has plenty of athletes who will gladly bend and break the rules to get a bigger paycheck, and many of them prosper far beyond what the straight shooters ever will. It'll always be like that. So I guess the only thing we can really take away from this, the greatest Paralympic scandal of all time, is cheaters may prosper, but they won't be happy. In a later interview, Seaman said this about the team's attitude during the medal ceremony. The whole thing was a farce, really. We stood there and listened, but it was a false medal. It was a false national anthem. Nobody really wanted to talk about it afterwards. See, that's the saddest thing about all this to me. Winning wasn't enjoyable for the team because the team's victory was a lie. A gold medal shines brightest when it's won fairly and honorably. It's not nearly as satisfying to win when there really was no challenge in the first place, right? And it's not just that they won by dishonest means, it's that they stole the medals from other teams that actually were battling these hard mental disabilities. They robbed those Paralympians of the opportunity to grab a moment of victory, a moment that many of them sorely needed. Cheat and get away with it, and every prize you receive will feel hollow and meaningless. Oh, and cheat and get caught? Be prepared to have that stuff stick to you for the rest of your life. Even Carlos Ribagorda, the hero of the story, will have his name forever connected to the events at Sydney, and he was the good guy. How much worse do you think it is to be one of the other nine, or the guy labeled as the mastermind of the whole operation in the end? Was this, was all of this, really worth it? In the heat of the moment, it might have seemed so, but at the last, what were they left with? So, uh, yeah, stay in school, kids. <laughs> Hey, thanks for watching. If you like the video, then share it. And if you want to see more content like that, then subscribe to the channel. Or if you don't, then don't. I don't really care.